All right, I'm opening it up now. Actually, I'm going to stand up. I got, a, okay. I got one of these very, I got one of these very desks. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Those are nice. So I got to make some adjustments here. Bear with me. I've All done right. this before. Usually I have it set up before I do this, not in the middle of it. There we go. I All right. prefer I to stand up when I'm presenting. On. Um, everyone, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. I'm kind of, if we're still got a couple minutes, even until, um, three o'clock. So, uh, please just bear with us here for a little bit while we wait for more people to join. Um, I'm going to be unmuting everyone as they, as they join the room here, just so that if you feel the need to ask any questions or anything like that, this is kind of an open forum communication thing. Feel free to use the chat box as well, but also. We're happy to talk to you. All right, I think we should just give everyone just a couple more minutes. It's just now three o'clock. So I think maybe if we can get started just a couple minutes after Dave, I think that would be good. Um, Sounds good. I'm just gonna give everybody another warning again. I am unmuting you all as you come into the room here so that if you feel the need to talk, you're more than welcome to. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, everyone, welcome to the Dell Data Protection Solutions webinar here. We have um, Dave Bikunski. He's going to be presenting for us this afternoon. Um, also, Chris McPherson here. He's going to be helping out, answering some questions in the chat box and, you know, getting everyone organized as well. Um, everyone, I'm going to ask you guys to try to hold off on opening your wine until after the presentation. That's when we will uh, start our wine tasting that we're going to be doing after this. Um, other than that, I think we should be good to get started here. Dave, does, does that sound about right? Sounds good to me. And I, I, would encourage, I would encourage the wine drinking because I will come across a lot better. Um, <laughs> if, 
people have been in, imbibing. So uh, feel free in my behalf to go ahead and uncork I'm the bottle. I'm sure bottles. you'll be entertaining. Um, <laughs> so um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And appreciate everyone taking the time out of their days today. And, um, you know, we've got uh, some good things lined up for you uh, after my presentation in terms of some, some wine tasting and charcuterie. And so uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but, uh, you know, we've got some business to do today. Um, Chris McPherson is one of my colleagues uh, located out in Ohio Valley uh, for the data protection to help support this. So any questions that come up uh, by way of chat, he can handle. If you have any questions along the way, um, you know, just prompt us and we'll, we'll stop and, and field them if you feel uh, comfortable enough to go in and ask him a question. So, um, you know, with that, again, my name is Dave Binkonski. I'm with uh, the Dell Data Protection Division um, located up uh, in the New England area. I've uh, been doing the data protection uh, role for uh, Dell, formerly EMC, legacy employee, uh, for about a dozen years. So i um, seen a lot of good activity take place. And what we're going uh, to talk today about is uh, cyber recovery and ransomware. Obviously, it's, it's a very um, you know, pertinent topic in terms of uh, what's happening out there in the industry. Um, you've probably all seen this. I'm quite sure you're very familiar about what's taking place out there. Uh, and you're all being very vigilant uh, and proactive in trying to prepare uh, for the imminent, if you will. Um, and some may have been affected already. Um, some are preparing not to be affected. So we're going to walk through some of the landscape and sort of just baseline it, if you will, and give you some examples, things you've probably already read about, some may haven't, but um, some that you're familiar with, um, pretty large scale names. And then why good isn't good enough uh, really touches on what disaster recovery is all about. I'll touch on that and then really get into the cyber recovery solution. Not a deep dive, if you will, but I'll walk through uh, what the solution is comprised of as well as the flow in terms of what it's all about with its automation uh, and then why Dell Technologies in terms of, you know, why, why us, right? What, what, is this, what is this solution we have and why you should consider us in terms of anyone else out there? So, you know, in terms of the, 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 the landscape, uh, 20, FY20 was an explosive year for uh, cyber ransomware attacks, as you saw. Um, obviously, it was ramping up along the way for a number of years, but last year it exploded. And one of the reasons were is that the, um, the attack vectors were it flattened the landscape because so many people went remote. And a lot of these remote desktop protocols were being, uh, you know, uh, basically exploited to go in and, and get into, in, into people's data centers and do a lot of bad things and damage uh, through the industry. And we still see that happening today. So when you look at this, it used to happen, you know, we could say every minute uh, an attack was happening. Now it's sped up and it's happening constantly every 11 seconds. And, you know, all this stuff is being motivated by money. Essentially, that's what's driving the lubricant in the system. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's where it's really driving it. And these things are getting more expensive. It's happening more often. Um, and it's not only in large organizations, but they're hitting it in smaller organizations, uh, whether it's a, a, a local school district, which we see often. Um, we see this in small organizations um, across the board, and it's just getting, um, you know, bigger and bigger as you've seen as it goes along. So, you know, it cuts across all industries. Uh, no one is um, going to be, uh, you know, safe from this. They're going to get in. We always say it's a matter of uh, when, not if. Um, so, you know, you can do all the right things and you should be doing all the right things to, to prepare the perimeter from attack. But once they're in, um, it, it's pretty much game over. It's now, what are we going to do around the recovery aspect in terms of getting through this? So, you know, moving on, we, we do a lot of research and, and surveys and, we, you know, we've, we found out that about close to 80% of global, global execs see this as the number one threat, right? And the question is, hey, do you, do you feel that? Are you in that percentage where... 80% is the number one threat to your organization, to your brand, uh, to your own, you know, livelihoods in terms of something happens, you know, how much of a threat is this uh, that you're feeling and close to 70% are lacking the confidence to recover. Again, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, how well are you prepared to be recovering your data, your data center back up and running as quick as possible uh, to make sure that you can be operational and keep, keep that brand going. Um, you know, how confident are you? How well prepared are you? Um, you know, when you look at the, when you look at NIST, you know, we, we are heavy on the recovery side, right? You can do all the things of threat detection and prevention, but what are you doing on the recovery aspect of it? Because that's the last resort that you're going to have. And what we find is that, you know, once these actors get in, 
and they come in various ways. A lot of them are doing, again, remote desktops. They're doing email phishing, whatever it may be. There could be some insider attacks, which we'll talk about. But once they're in, it's not an immediate hit. They're basically going in, and they're looking and, and surveying the landscape, mapping out your IT data center, understanding where things are located. Where is your DR center? Where is your backups? Where are the heavy workloads? Um, you know, where are your cloud um, gateways, if you will, your accounts? They're going to the Active Directory, and they're in there, and they're mapping this out. They're doing their reconnaissance, and they could be in there for 100 days, de depending on the complexity of um, the, the complexity of your organization and IT center. You know, when, once they've got it all mapped out, they hit the payload, and all hell breaks loose. Um, the first thing they're going after is the backup devices in your DR center, because that's how you're going to be able to recover. That's the first thing they're taking out in terms of your lines of defense. Once that's taken care of, and now they're in there and they're, uh, whether they're stealing data, they're encrypting data, whatever they're doing, um, it's really bad things, right? And so you look at this and you're like, how do we, how do we prevent that? Or how do we recover from that? And the, the key is the isolated recovery aspect of it. Have a device that's separated from the network that is uh, stealth, that is not seen. So once they're in there, and they're doing their recon, they don't see what this device is. It's offline, it's not connected to the network. It's air-gapped, uh, which is a key factor. So that air-gapped message is what we're all about. So when you look at this, you can have it air-gapped, uh, and but we've got a lot of different uh, you know, possibilities from insider threats, right? We have different, we have you know, organized crime, we have state-sponsored uh, um, you know, espionage that goes on. We read it in the paper, what's happening. We see nation states going after other nations and doing some pretty nasty things with cyber warfare. It's happening all over the place. But one thing you also have to keep in mind is the insider threat. How do you prepare for that? Um, because we can do all the right things on the perimeter. We can protect everything, but there could be somebody inside that wants to do something nasty for a variety of reasons. And an example on this case, uh, it was a Tesla employee who was approached by, uh, you know, Russian people, um, whether it was the nation or some, uh, you know, criminals or whatever, uh, was offering a million dollars to go in there and do some crazy things to Tesla. This employee was obviously not uh, uh, going to bite for it. Uh, he felt uh, some loyalty to the organization, and he went to the FBI and they thwarted it. So you have to keep in mind of, yep, there's external, the existential threat, but you also have the inside threat. And what our solution has is the ability to have multi-factor authentication built in so that it's, think about the nuclear codes. We're not going to have one person to get access into the cyber recovery vault. We're going to have multiple people. So you're going to have two sets of keys or, you know, able to get in there so that nobody can do that um, to any of the systems. So when you think about immutable copies, um, and we hear this about immutable copy, which is a great feature and function, and, and Dell's had this. Uh, with data domain for, you know, decades, um, the immutable copy is vulnerable. One, it's sitting on the network, too, but an insider threat can go in there and mess around uh, with the retention lock clocks and, and fast forward them, and the next thing you know, that immutable copy of data that you thought was locked down in gold has now been either deleted, changed, or whatever happened to it. Um, the insider can go in there and mess around with it quite, uh, quite effectively, so that's something to keep in mind. And then when we look at the headlines, uh, these, some of you read about these, um, Kia, um, you know, they paid a $20 million ransom. Um, for pennies on the dollar, what they paid for that ransom, they could have installed a cyber recovery vault and not had to worry about the ransom attack. They could have taken that decision off the table and said, well, we don't have to pay it. We have the ability to recover. So please go away. We don't need to pay you that money. Do whatever you want to do. We, we can go ahead and, and recover. Uh, Maersk was a, a very, you know, worldwide known one uh, in terms of what happened to them, where their their pit business was basically rendered uh, shut down. Uh, you had ships out at sea, you had ports that couldn't communicate, their GPS systems were knocked out, and the only reason why they were able to recover is that there was a server that was offline in uh, a country within Africa that they found and were able to build, rebuild the network. They had a copy of the Active Directory and some other uh, vital critical build materials on that server, and they were able to rebuild and get back up and running and save their organization. And then we look at Baltimore. We know what happened there, um, and they're still trying to recover. Right? Think about how long ago that was. They still haven't fully recovered uh, 100%. And then there's other instances that we look at. Right? Um, you, you've heard about 
solar winds that was still being talked about uh, in terms of what took place there in the Department of Treasury. And we still don't know how long they were even involved or even the scope of damage that was taken uh, into consideration. So they're still trying to figure all that out. And then you know about fire, uh, the fire eye attack, um, which sort of came out of the solar winds piece, which was an interesting proposition because what they were after were for the attack tools, the tools that fire eye uses to stress test their ability to, to, um, to keep these bad actors at bay. How do we prevent them from getting into the network? And these, att these attackers took that information, so they were able to basically steal the playbook to figure out what the defense mechanisms is, and then sell that information and share it and understand the vulnerabilities around the FireEye um, customer base, right? So they took a lot of information, um, and FireEye obviously was, was, was reeling about that one as well as their customers. So, um, you know, they're, 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 they're battling back and, and doing all the right things to prepare for that. But if a cybersecurity organization can get attacked and attacked, um, then most likely uh, most people can as well. In addition, um, you know, we see North Korea um, who got hacked um, or actually is out there. What they're doing is basically um, uh, funding their entire government on cyber attacks, uh, which, is, which is interesting because um, that's, with all the sanctions on them, that's how they're, they're going about this. So it's pretty interesting to see uh, what, what's going on uh, with, with North Korea at this point. So when you look at, uh, when I move on to the next slide, when you look at the Department of Treasury and we think about all the things that are happening and the ransomware payments that are being made, um, the Department of Treasury said, look, the money is the problem. We need to do something about this. So now they're looking at putting sanctions on organizations that are paying the ransomware to try to prevent the money from being spent. So as an organization, you are now put in a pickle, if you will, where if we pay this ransom to save our organization, uh, we can then be sanctioned by the United States Treasury Department. Or we are now put out of business because we didn't you know, pay the ransom and we got a problem because now we can't get back up and running. So what national, what's going to happen is we got to go find a solution. And that's where uh, Dell and Advisor can come in and talk to you about this cyber recovery vault in terms of what it's able to provide. Again, these are organizations out there. You can go look these up. These are all uh, regulatory agencies across the globe that are recommending air gaps. Got to be off the, off the uh, network. Got to be offline. You got to have be available and be able to be resilient. Again, this is all about recovery because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it happens and how are we going to be able to recover. So out of all this, um, back in 2015, if you remember, roll back your, your, your memory into when Sony got hit, right? That was the first one that hit the hit the, um, um, the news, right? That's what made everyone wake up and said, what is this all about? Well, about that time, um, we had our customers being the number one data protection organization. Our customers were coming to us and saying, we, we got to do something about this because at Sony, they took out the data domains. They knocked out the backups, as we said. And so now it was like, well, what do we need to do to prevent this? And that's where we first initiated the uh, first isolated recovery solution. It was uh, more manual, more intervention, uh, required in terms of setting it up, in terms of manually uh, managing it and recovering and all that. So it was a little bit the first iteration, the, you know, Cyber Recovery Vault 1.0. Fast forward about, you know, three, four years, it's nice and automated now where when it, once it's in, I don't want to say, click, you know, set it and forget it, but it's automated uh, and you can go in and do some management around it, but it's much more elegant in terms of its approach, in terms of what it's able to do. There's a lot of uh, intelligence built into it from a scanning capabilities, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then we looked at back in uh, 2019, there's an organization called Sheltered Harbor. Sheltered Harbor is a consortium of about 30 organizations and the financial institutions that created a set of standards specifically designed to be able to recover from a ransomware attack for a financial institution, basically to keep the confidence of that organization intact, but also have the confidence of the uh, clientele be intact as well, knowing that their data is safe, right? So we're the first solution that was um, endorsed by them. No one else has this, which goes and shows uh, and demonstrates that this product that we have, this solution we have is rock solid uh, and no one else has been endorsed by them. And obviously we've got 750 clients and it's growing. So people are um, basically voting with their wallet, if you will, in terms of what solution out there works best. Again, Sheltered Harbor, uh, it's a process, uh, financial institution uh, packaged, if you will. So they set up a set of standards and basically um, 
uh, through an assessment process, understands exactly the data required within a financial institution that needs to be backed up, that needs to be put into the vault, that needs to be able to be recovered and presented to the person um, and their user if they're going to transact, you know, on that particular day. So it's got to be quick. It's got to be immediate. It's got to be, uh, you know, rock solid. And we are part of that process. The data, the cyber recovery vault is part of that process. That's where that that information is going to sit. So there's a whole process involved in this and setting it up, but we're part of that process and we've been endorsed. So if there's any financial institutions uh, on the call today and you're part of Sheltered Harbor, uh, Advisex can go ahead and provide this data uh, vault to you. Um, this process, this uh, organization is what you're a member of and this is what it's all about. So uh, we have a lot of banking and financial institutions that have adopted this and have deployed the cyber recovery vault into their organization. So something to keep in mind and talk to Advisex about uh, in terms of going forward. Um, another key point, just to bring it up, all data domain users have cyber recovery software embedded within their solution. So you can literally take what you have today um, and leverage that as a foundational element for the cyber recovery vault solution. Uh, my advice would be, hey, depending on how old it is, uh, you're basically up to, up to uh, the right rev on the, the code, you can then uh, move that into a vault or set that up as a vault and uh, purchase another data domain as the, uh, the production site, if you will, and then you can create your vault out of that uh, at a very elemental uh, level so that you can go ahead and do your replication and have it air-gapped, uh, automated, and you're all set to go. So it's a little investment um, to get going. Um, on, the, on this selection here, um, the Cyber Recovery Vault is called a mini data center. It's a converged uh, product set where you've got uh, the Cyber Recovery application. Again, it's going to be sitting within the data domain, so we've got a, uh, a UI interface in there. And we'll talk a little bit more of that on the upcoming process. Um, it's got the recovery server, so you can actually do this recovery process within a clean room, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Data domain is the, the bedrock foundation piece, so you've got your firewall, your switches, CyberSense, I'll talk about that. That's the uh, analytical piece, the AI piece that's going to be sitting within the vault. And then the overall management server in terms of managing this, setting it up, uh, making sure it's run properly uh, with all the alerts and everything. So it's going to be separated. It can be in another location, right? Or it can be on site. We recommend to have it on site just for uh, more security purposes that it's not um, somewhere off site. So it's going to take up a little space, but it's going to be sitting there and it's, it's, um, uh, intelligently isolated and partitioned off the network. Again, it can't be seen. So once these actors, these bad actors get in there, they're not going to be able to see or find it. So going a little bit deeper into this in terms of the solution and how it works, in today's environment, the cyber environment, right, you've got everything sitting on the network. You've got your DR site. So disaster recovery is not cyber recovery because what's going to happen is the disaster recovery site is very good for natural disasters, whether it's a fire, a flood, an earthquake, um, something gets blown up, you can recover from that. What these bad actors do, as I mentioned earlier, are going to go in and take that disaster recovery site out because it's on the network. They're going to find it and they're going to take it out. So the cyber recovery environment today is really everything's on production. If everything's on production, it's a target. So like we mentioned, the remote desktop and uh, protocols and fissions are really the act as a primary attack vector is how they're getting into these networks. So this would be your standard you know, environment, if you will. Moving forward, when you have the vault uh, deployed, you know, it's going to create that air gap. It's going to create that offline storage backup copy, if you will. So it's going to provide the protection also from an insider threat, because I mentioned um, you're going to have multi-layered authentication to get into the vault, right? And it's going to provide offline data analytics, and we'll talk more about that, but it's going to sit in its own piece with the recovery server uh, intact. So Basically going through the basics of this, the vault is segmented off the network, right? Everything is managed from the vault uh, with the cyber recovery software. The data diode is a single point of exit, which means that this is where the alerts are going to go out, right? Nothing can get in, but we want to be able to see when an alert goes off, when the scanning takes place, it's going to alert, and then we can take a proactive measure, right? So, and this is the major difference between us and the competition. It's a air gap solution. It's automated. Nobody in the industry has it. Again, that's why we saw Sheltered Harbor take us on and endorse us and put it in. Others are claiming the air gap, but we brought this to market five years ago, um, four or five years ago, or six years ago, I should say. And now they're 
co-opting that, that message, right? Only because we're successful and they're, we're leading this, we created this solution and this uh, around what was happening. So looking at the process, um, you know, the cyber recovery vault, so the basic construct of this whole thing is M trees, right? So you've got your production data, you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna back that up to data domain. It's gonna go into the M tree, right? So now you just do your daily backup. And what's gonna happen next is based on how everything is set up, there's gonna be, a, um, uh, it's gonna close the air gap. It's gonna copy that data over, replicate it into the data domain within the vault, create the M tree, right? It's gonna tell you on the UI that your jobs are successful. It's been properly backed up and properly copied into the cyber recovery vault. Again, this is all automated. So once it's set up, this is gonna happen based on the parameters that you set it up to run this. It could be once a day, it could be alternating every 12 uh, hours, or it could be, you know, however much you wanna do it. Um, you could do it every other day, you know, whatever, whatever you feel is gonna be the right uh, proponent to get it done. So once it's copied, right, we're gonna see that, it's gonna be displayed, um, and then it's gonna go ahead and create another copy, right, a fast copy, if you will, it's gonna lock that down. That's the immutable copy that we talk about. That, that's unchangeable, it's locked down and loaded. Once it's locked and loaded, we're gonna copy that into a sandbox. So now we got our immutable copy, we've got another copy that's sitting in a sandbox, and then now CyberSense, is the analytical portion of this, which is going to go and run policies and jobs against that copy that was brought in. And what it's doing is it's going to be looking for the changes from the previous copy. It's gonna be looking at a very uh, deep level of the document. Um, if there's any changes to any nomenclature within the document, any of the, um, any, any uh, like call them attachments that were on there that are no longer, it's gonna look at the the executables that may be in there. And it's gonna be just looking for variants, if you will. It's not looking for the malware. Uh, there's no fingerprint. It's actually looking at the document in a very deep level um, and also trying to find that. So it's comparing and contrasting against its index uh, that's been created with it. So it's gonna run that against it. If it finds something, the alert is gonna go out, right? Once the alert's out, we know we've brought something bad into the system. Now, nothing has happened. Uh, from a malware attack at this point, but uh, like all of a sudden, like, okay, we just did so something came into the system that's bad. So the beauty of this system is now, it's also part of your threat detection and prevention policies, if you will, not only recovery, but we're preventing and, and, and detecting. So once that happens, you're gonna get an alert back on the system, critical alert pops up, right? What do we do? We gotta take some action. Cyber uh, Sense is going to be able to provide a report to you to basically identify where that file sits within production. So now you can take this and go find that, where that data is or where that file is or whatever it is and go ahead and clean that out before something bad happens. Um, in the event something does happen outside production, we can then go ahead and recover from the vault. So we've got a, a multi-layer way of trying to not only prevent but also recover because again, it's probably going to happen and we're going to try to prevent it, but this is adding another layer or hardening your, your, your level of, of uh, defenses in there. So again, CyberSense, um, I think I got one more slide on this. So CyberSense, again, it's going to do the scan and with an analytical portion, it's, it's, it's basically creating that index of what's in that gold copy because the data is always going to be the same that you're bringing into the vault because it's a set of what you felt are the critical build materials that need to be in that vault. And that could be 5% of all your data or it could be 100%. But typically we look at about 10, 10 20% percent is what's gonna be required to build that up. And so as it index builds, as it sees what the files are doing, it's gonna understand uh, what it's looking for. It's gonna run its analysis and it's gonna keep repeating this process uh, as it goes on. And then it's gonna continue to do the forensics. And if something goes wrong, then we can go ahead and find the reports, do some investigatory work, Cyber sense is also part of the recovery process because if something goes bad, we're going to find where those logs are, right, uh, to understand what we brought into the vault um, and be able to clean that out. So when we go to recover back into production, we know we're bringing gold clean copies back into production um, because there, if you don't roll it back far enough, 
um, which could happen. You could relaunch the variant back into production, and you're now in the uh, whole world of hurt again. You just repeated the process. Um, so you've really got to be wary of um, you know what what's going to take place with um, when you bring these variants in. So in the sense of when you bring a variant into the vault, because it's an executable, uh, there's no compute power within the vault, if you will. It's sitting idle, so it can't do anything to the vault. It will sit static. So it's held dormant until it's brought back into production, and that's when it can wreak havoc. So we talked about the critical build materials. These are really part of an assessment process, if you will. So when you're working with Advisix and you want to sit down and you want to really look into this, um, they're going to want to look at what, what do we need to do to get to the baseline to build this up. Um, most organizations' data centers aren't built in a day. Um, they're built over time. People change. People come and go. They don't know what, what's where. And you've got, obviously, run books uh, to create um, and, uh, you know, architectural maps to figure out to go ahead and build this. And that's why it takes so long to rebuild from a, from a catastrophic hit from a ransomware. This will at least provide you with the intelligence to get you up and running, whether it's, you know, um, through um, the active directory pieces, the networking and, and switching and routing and all the storage arrays that are out there, all the intellectual property and source code that you've built, all that information is going to be contained to go ahead and build it up. So um, we have stories um, where people, one organization uh, out West, and I, I really can't say their name, but um, we're working on them to become a, a a reference, um, but it was a school district that was hit multiple times. They paid the ransom. And because these bad actors, you know, you're, you're going to reward the bad behavior. You're going to get more of it. So not, not that they just come and they come and you pay them and they leave, they could be still sitting in your network and then go ahead and launch it three, four months later. And you're paying again. Well, they got hit twice and they finally decided to invest in um, the vault. Um, they deployed the vault. And this was a school system, and it happened uh, August of last year. A week before the, the vault got deployed, it was up and running and tested. The run books were all not complete yet. A week before school started, they got hit, right? Took the, took the network out again. The vault wasn't touched because it wasn't on the network. So um, what happened there is the state of California came in, insurance companies came in, the FBI was called. They rendered the entire uh, data center a, um, a crime scene. Uh, at that point, no one can do anything. Everything is like, you got to leave. No one can come in. So they got to do what they need to do, the invest investigatory work. Um, and, but during that time, um, the organization and, um, was able to sit down and map out the dependencies and what was going to start from which piece, right? What VM do we need to start building first? Which one is going to build the foundation and how are we going to start layering this on? So they created the run book on the fly at that point because it was so new. They hadn't gotten it fully finished. So they created that run book. And they were able to get up and running. Uh, it took about a week for all the uh, investigation stuff to take place. And once that wrapped up, it took them three or four days to recover back up and running. And they were able to open up school right on time and be able to learn. Uh, the other significant factor on that, they had 25 laptop, 2,500 laptops they had to bring back in to re-image um, and put some um, security in, in security. Uh, software within the laptops to make sure that uh, they weren't going to be uh, vulnerable again. So it, was, it wasn't a heavy lift per se, um, but they were able to recover and it was assured because they knew that they had invested in the vault and it was 100% proven. Um, and they were extremely pleased about the fact that, that this was going to be the third time and they didn't pay the ransom and they were able to go ahead uh, and, and recover. So when you look at this and you say, okay, why Dell, right? And I really touched on a lot of this. First and foremost, we're the only ones that are air-gapped. Um, no one can claim an operational air-gap that's fully automated and isolated off the network, right? You may hear that uh, we put it up in the cloud uh, and we do a lot of our analytics up in the cloud. Well, I can tell you this, that these bad actors, when they get in, they know organizations have cloud accounts. They know how to go and get the credentials and rest assured when they get into that system, they're going to look for everything and they're going to go in and they're going to find the credentials to the cloud and they're going to shut that down and they're going to cause harm out there. They know what to do. They're very smart and they get smarter each day. So having a true air gap and not leveraging the cloud, but having it truly off the network is what you really need to do. You also have it multi-layered security design, right, to protect against that insider threat on the full array of threats. 
right? Including those insiders, right? You've got a lot of things to consider. And then it's fully automated. It's got the full orchestration and air gap and that modern UI. Um, and then again, the, the full secure analytics that we have in there, that is another layer of security to help you prevent the attack from taking, but also make sure when you have to recover, you're going to be recovering with a full gold copy, right? And again, keep in mind the fact that Sheltered Harbor did endorse us. We're part of their, uh, they were part of their process and no other organization. Uh, they looked at everybody. Again, you know, Dell uh, being the number one um, data protection company in the industry, obviously there's, there's competitors out there that have some pretty good products. Um, but the, and they looked at them all and they, they settled on ours because it was truly automated, air gap, and isolated from the network and, and recoverable. Um, and again, this is a mature solution. Uh, we've had this out there for five or six years now. We've got seven, probably a thousand customers at this point. This slide, I don't know when it was built, but they, this is happening worldwide. So there's been a lot of adoption of our solution out there uh, and it's bulletproof. Um, it's, it's, we've had people hit after it's been deployed and they're very happy that it's happened. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of information. I think that's my last slide. Um, so a lot of information on that. Um, I would uh, urge you to, you know, if you want to dive deeper, to reach out uh, to the Advisex organization. Um, they've got a, a highly skilled set of people out there that can go ahead and guide you and what you need to learn more about that. And obviously, partnering with Dell, we've got uh, a lot of people that can uh, be leaned on as well to help you uh, fully understand what this product is all about and how it's going to uh, get the business outcome that you're looking for in terms of when we get hit, how am I going to recover, right, and, and talk to you about that. So, you know, with that, I'll turn it back um, to Tori, and I appreciate if there's any questions, you know, we still got, you know, five, ten minutes here, but um, otherwise we can get to the wine drinking. But if there's any questions, we'd be glad to take those. So thank you very much for your time. Hey, Dave, yes. uh, there were a couple of questions in chat. I was able to respond to them. I do have a very good question that I responded to with my opinion. I'd like yours as well as a longtime data protection guy here. Um, the question is, understanding that the vault allows for offline analytics, can existing third-party analytic or scanning, scanning tools read the data in the vault, or is it stored in a proprietary format unique to CyberSense? And the question was asked because some security teams may have their own preferred malware ransomware tools that they may want to leverage. My initial thought as a response was that we leverage CyberSense as the preferred scanning analytic detection tool inside our vault that I personally am not aware of other analytic or scanning tools being currently utilized inside our cyber recovery vault. But that really mean that other tools can't be used as well. However, that may raise some supportability questions uh, going forward. Dave, what are your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say you're, you're spot on. Um, and just to round it off a little bit that, you know, um, it, it's this, the CyberSense is not, um, it's an optional, right? You don't have to have CyberSense within the vault. So therefore, you can use a third party, but to your point, um, how do you, we have to go ahead and um, look at the, um, the, girl. The, the ability to search. Hello? Can you, it's like, so if you put it in there, then it's a certification issue and a support issue that you're bringing in a third party um, scanning device into the vault. Um, so that would have to be looked at uh, in terms of the support mechanism because we, we, we recommended CyberSense because of its, its true nature of really deep diving on that capability to scan not only the metadata, but to go really deep into the document uh, and does such a fantastic job. Um, so, you know, we don't have anybody using a third party product. Um, a majority of these users are using CyberSense. Uh, it's not to say that it can't because uh, data domains pretty much, um, you know, if you look at it, the, the foundational piece of data domain is that we are software agnostic. So any backup software target can copy into data domain. Um, so it's holding within the M trees um, in terms of how it does its file system. So all we're doing is scanning the file system. Um, so it's probably a, a able to do it. I couldn't confirm it, but we would have to go ahead and certify it and run testing against it uh, and see what happens. Um, so I think Chris, your answer is pretty spot on. Um, I haven't seen it happen, but uh, I would bet just the way data domains design that it is open uh, to allow a third party in there, just how we deal with it from a support mechanism. 
And Dave, we do have another question in chat. It's a good question. And I think you answered part of it earlier so we can finish it. For existing data domain customers, what is the roadmap to implement? And as you mentioned, for existing data domain customers, provided they have the right version level of the data domain software, they've already got the functionality to set up a vault in effectively half of the solution with at least one data domain in production. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you're a data domain user and you've got the, I, I would say the latest rev, but you're, you could, I think it just rolls, you could roll back, you know, maybe two, three revs back and it's going to be embedded in within the software. So you literally have half of that device. Um, you, you don't need that full integrated converged infrastructure that I showed. You could literally just set up a data domain with an automated air gap and have one in production and then set up the vault. Uh, and be able to then just do that fundamental, elemental, foundational piece. Uh, what happens there, though, is, you know, you, you may want to have a management console in there to manage it at, at, at the bare minimum. Now, whether you start to build this out with data diodes and put um, CyberSense on there, it could be an inter incremental grow. Um, so you don't have to take it all at once. You can lay the foundation and then build on top of that. Um, so... Yes, the answer is if you have a data domain, you've got half of the solution all ready to go. Um, it's not going to be as robust, um, but you may not need a robust solution on the onset. You may feel like we just want to get this in place um, so that we can prevent, um, we've got the capability to recover right away. Uh, and that's where, you know, Advisex can come in and that's where data, uh, where, where Dell can come in from an advisory, advisory point of view to talk to you about, you know, what, is you, what do you want from a business outcome to look like and we can set you up uh, for success. So hopefully that answers the question. You asked for questions. We have another one, Dave. Does the target data domain in the vault allow a many to one replication or do you have to back up all the data to one data domain source to replicate into the vault? So can you so have- if you got multiple data domains in production writing to the vault or do you have to set up a single data domain source in production that writes to the vault that's a good question um so you just look at this from a replication standpoint um and you could because what's happening is you're going to be going into the one connection so um just backing this up i would think you would you're going to need many you're gonna need one-to-one. -one. Uh, I'd have to validate that. Um, it's a good question. I'm not really sure how that sets up from a technical standpoint, but it, you're really just replicating into the vault is really what's happening. So if you've got multiple data domains and you're replicating over to a DR, think of it as a DR site for lack of a better word um, uh, or phrase, if you will. Um, but I need to go ahead and, and probably get an answer for that one. I don't know, Chris, if you've got any thoughts around that one. Well, the only thought I have, and we should research it and get back to this particular gentleman, um, we are doing a pull into the vault. And the only thing that we are pulling are the block level changes on a daily basis after that full commit into the vault takes place. And remember, what goes into the vault is typically only about 10 to 12 percent of a company's overall backup. It's only the critical data and critical rebuild materials necessary to get the business back up and running and restore your systems. So by only uh, replicating those black level changes, after the first commit to the vault takes place, it's very, a very small amount of information. It's typically very fast to pull it into the vault and then seal it right. off. But I did capture that uh, gentleman's information so we can follow up with him directly. Yeah, if you can uh, get uh, his email address, uh, and then um, I'll reach out to um, Ed internally here, and he'll give me an answer relatively quickly uh, just to validate it. But I, um, to your point, it's it's a very it's a subset, a small subset of data, so it's not um, it's not a large amount of data coming in, or it's as large as you want it to be. Good Are question. there any services that can help uh, all that critical rebuild material that may not be backed up to one replicated device? And absolutely, we, uh, we absolutely have services in conjunction with Advisex. We work closely together uh, to help determine the important critical rebuild material and critical data that you need to commit to the vault. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, you know, just in, in 
you want those critical bill materials, they'll, they'll be able to identify them and help you and guide you through that process and then call out other possible, uh, you know, intellectual property that you may have. For example, um, if you think about a world-renowned paint organization, uh, any one of them for that matter, uh, what's their intellectual property? What's their core foundation? Is the the um, uh, the ingredients of their colors of their paints, you know, schemes, if you will, right? Um, those in, in one of the customers that we had, they they wanted to back that up. Obviously, they needed that to understand what the uh, uh, what the mixtures looked like in order to recover that and be able to get up and running. So it could be those elemental pieces or that piece of intellectual property that's core to your business. Uh, and those are the discussions from an advisory standpoint that they that, that you sit down and have that discussion uh, as you walk through this. Um, and, and again, a lot of times you're going to have um, not only the security organization involved, you may have legal involved, and you're going to have IT involved and also the business, right? So there could be a lot of stakeholders involved in discussion in terms of what they feel is going to be critical uh, to make sure that we've got the right data in the vault. So it's 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 um, it, it spans across the organization because everyone's going to have a stake to get up uh, what they feel is important. Dave, I do not see any additional questions in chat at this time. I think those who have not yet cracked open their bottles of wine are ready to do so. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Um, we'll turn it back over to Advisex to uh, get us up and running with the wine drinking. I'm still muted. <laughs> Thank you, Dave and Chris. That was great. Really appreciate it. Lots of good information there and questions seem to be good too. So thanks guys. That was awesome. Um, I'm good. going to go ahead and ask Brooke to join us now. She is going to be our tasting host for the wine. Um, so for those of you that haven't yet, you can get your wine out, I believe. And um, I think two glasses is what we were told to do. One or one or two, just so you don't have to get up and keep rinsing the other one. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, switching gears, I guess, a little bit. Just caught me. <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to pour yourself a glass of the Sauvignon Blanc, um, the La Pluma Sauvignon Blanc. It has a feather on it. Um, absolutely. There we go. Sorry. Yes, Tori's displaying our, boom. <laughs> I'll be the displayer here. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Um, and yeah, if you don't have two glasses, do not worry, do not fret, we'll make it work. Um, also, the other piece is there are two bottles of wine in front of you. Um, each bottle is about a quarter, so please uh, drink safely, although I'm sure most of you are in your homes. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me and, and our group and what we do, um, my name is Brooke, as I mentioned, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, um, but born and raised in New York, so have been a sommelier for about 10 years now, um, have worked in the food and beverage space for close to 15 years, um, and we as a group at In Good Taste are really dedicated to providing um, wine tastings that reflect the regions that we um, serve. So we're pretty unique in the sense that we're based in Sonoma, but we're a global winery. We make winery, wine from all over the world, um, Australia most recently, but France, Italy, um, as well as everywhere in the country. We have a wonderful head winemaker, a Matt Smith. He came from over a decade at Kendall Jackson. So super, super exciting to have a traditional California winemaker kind of branch out into all these other places. Um, we'll be taking a quick trip around California today. Um, and I know that we are um, meant to finish in about 45 minutes. If for whatever reason um, you have to dip out a little bit early, by all means, just head out and um, feel free to unmute yourself and also join in on the conversation. This is meant to be super interactive. Um, and without further ado, we're going to jump into the first wine, the Sauvignon Blanc, and we'll talk about the five S's, right? So I, I have my lovely co-host here, Tori. Um, <laughs> five S's, right? We look at the wine, we see it, we swirl it, we smell it, we can take sips, and then we savor it. So with, would anyone like to kind of call out anything that they notice from the first wine? 
Um, it's sweeter. <laughs> it's white. <laughs> this is helping. <laughs> I know that's my that's my favorite go to when someone asks me to blind taste wine because that's kind of like the sommelier you know magic trick if you will. It's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. That's like what we get asked to do. Oftentimes I'm like, the wine is white. You know, the wine is red. Smells <laughs> like red wine. Start. <laughs> Good to go. Yeah. So um, if any of you have had Sauvignon Blanc before, um, some of the notable characteristics that we get from Sauvignon Blanc are these green notes, right? Exactly. So pear, exactly. That's, you know, is it green pear? Is it yellow pear? Um, right? That's kind of what we talk about when we're talking about describing the wine. Um, we also get grassy aromas, right? Mm -hmm. So one of those things that we get from grassy, jalapeno, um, green bell pepper is something called pyrazine. And that's the same compound that creates the aromas of like fresh cut grass. Um, although we don't have like a very distinct season here in Texas. Um, growing up in New York, right? Groundhog Day is one thing. But truly the way to figure out if it's springtime is the fresh cut grass that you smell. Um, it's one of my favorite, favorite aspects of you know, realizing that spring is here. Spring is sprung, if you will. This is really crisp and acid as well, right? And so Tori mentioned sweetness. And some of that comes from the fact that 30% of this wine comes from Paso Robles, which is a quite warm um, region within California. It's definitely warmer than most of the other areas in San Luis Obispo where this wine comes from. Um, so from the cool climate, you'll kind of get that unripe pineapple, maybe some grapefruit, grassiness, green bell pepper, things like that. But from the Paso, that 30% of Paso Robles wine, we're getting citrus and tropical notes, right? It's like pineapple and maybe um, ruby grapefruit instead of that kind of underripe grapefruit peel. Um, this is absolutely also like just a classic palate cleanser. If you are not salivating, we're not doing it right. Um, so that crisp, bright acid here is really meant to start the day. This is all also entirely in stainless steel tanks. But um, if any of you have ever had Fumé Blanc, which is a California distinct version of Sauvignon Blanc, that generally indicates there's some oak aging there, um, which generally gives some of that rounder and fuller palate, like weightiness. Um, so think when you think about weight of the palate, um, it's easy to think about water, right? Being like that simple, very light, bright, you can't get much, you know, crisper, right? Than cold water. Um, and as you get to rounder, riper, juicier, think about, you know, whole grape juice where it has some of that sugar um, to just kind of round it out. Um, and that can be from a bunch of different things that we'll talk about a few as we go through. Um, so, if you've ever had a Sancerre from France, um, Sancerre is Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire Valley. Um, and of course, Sauvignon Blanc uh, originated in France. And actually, Sauvignon Blanc has two parents uh, of grapes that you may know. Um, one of those, so brother, sorry, Cabernet Sauvignon has two parents that we may have heard of before. So the first is Sauvignon Blanc, and the second is Cabernet Franc. Um, so we'll notice some of those green bell pepper aromas as we get into Cabernets a little bit later today. So the next wine that we're going to hop into, I know we kind of speed through this. It's like really, truly a testament as to how capable you are as to speed tasting. Um, You're talking to the right group, Brooke. I think we can handle some speed tasting. <laughs> perfect. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. It's like watching right through. Um, and, and so... I don't know how many of you, and maybe you can chat in, or um, if you, I know you know it's on their video right now, but right, how many of you have ever had a California Chardonnay? Probably most of us, right, in some capacity. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, oh, hi, David. Off the mute. Let's get it. Nope, just kidding. No. Okay. <laughs> You're totally okay. Um, so, with Chardonnay. If you don't like Chardonnay, it's because you haven't found the one that's right for you. Um, Chardonnay comes in so many different styles. Blanc de Blanc Champagne um, is generally from 100% Chardonnay. Chablis, um, of course, the French classic outside of Burgundy um, is where Chardonnay is thought to have originated and of course a very different style. 
Um, and then we have California Chardonnay. And so what are some of the things that we think about with California Chardonnay? Maybe ripe, oaky, creamy, buttery. Um, this Chardonnay is a little bit different. So um, as you kind of begin to sip and, and savor this, um, this definitely has a fair amount of alcohol. There's a little bit of barrel fermentation, so we are getting some toastier notes. Um, but there's also that richness that comes from that. Definitely also a wine that has some pear, maybe some apple, some lime, um, a little bit of warm vanilla. And the apple, when we think about apple and the flavor, it's also a quality thing, right? So um, is the apple right off the, right off the tree? Is it a stewed apple? I think in this case, the apples are almost baked. It's almost like a, a baked apple tart, you know? Um, and that comes from the oak aging. So when we think about what oak influences in wine, particularly white wine, um, is vanilla and rich baking spices. So that's why I say it's kind of like a baked apple, um, definitely like baked apple, baked pear. Uh, the other really beautiful thing that we do with Chardonnay that we don't do with a lot of other grapes is something called malolactic fermentation. And not to get too, um, detailed here in like the semantics and technicalities of winemaking. But to put it simply, uh, malic acid is that green apple. If you've ever bitten into a Granny Smith apple and you get that crisp acid, that's malic acid. Um, we can actually transform that in the winemaking process by stirring the yeast. Um, and if you haven't seen yeast, but we just went through this past you know, year or so. Um, so I'm sure some of you have been doing some bread making at home. Um, yeast almost looks like flaky salt. And so we stir up that vat of wine and it transfers that malic acid into lactic acid, which is of course a dairy based on its name, lactic. Um, kind of a dairy sort of acid. And that's where we get these buttery notes that California has become really, really famous for. So right, to Kim's point, um, you definitely get oak here and that vanilla and maybe some of that like baking spice and actually oak, right, cedar, things like that. Um, but that buttery component is actually something entirely separate. And that's that malolactic fermentation. This is like done only a little bit in this wine. You can do it until it literally tastes and smells like buttered popcorn. Um, but this is a little bit more restrained version of that, of course. Um, and so, yeah, you can make Chardonnay the way we did the Sauvignon Blanc with just stainless steel, or you can use some older oak that doesn't impart so much of the flavor and influence, and then all the way to, you know, full new oak. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, Chardonnay is one of the grapes that is allowed in Champagne. Um, and while there's a, several more grapes that can be used in Champagne, the three main ones are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Um, so I'm sure many of you have had a Pinot Noir, and if not, don't worry, we'll get to it in a few minutes. <laughs> um, so really, really enjoy this wine. It's mostly from Monterey, um, Arroyo Seco, Santa Lucia Highlands. Uh, Lucia Highlands rather, uh, and Monterey County. So um, south of like the Bay Area where we think about typical winemaking. Hey Brooke, what's the difference between uh, like the brand of butter Chardonnay versus a Chardonnay? Yes, perfect example. So as I mentioned that malolactic fermentation situation, that buttery popcorn, that's where you're gonna get the most butter. And then when you start going to places like Oregon, um, they make a ton of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, actually. They're very Burgundian in that way. They like Burgundy. Um, but that's more stainless steel and neutral oak. So when you're thinking about oak treatment, in addition to the malolactic fermentation, because generally when you use more mallow, you're usually using oak as well. So the butter and the toast kind of come together and they're kind of partners in crime if you see butter. Um, but think about oak like a pair of leather shoes. Um, I hope no one's vegan here, sorry. Um, but right, when you get a brand new pair or you know, brand new wood even, right? It's, it's very similar. So that first year, when you use an oak barrel, you get a lot of that vanilla and baking spices from it. That second year, you get a little bit, but maybe not too much. 
And then if you like Chablis, for example, um, from Burgundy, Chablis is usually from neutral oak. So that's barrels that are like three or four years and older. And so we get oxidation from that, but we don't get, which, which does in, impart a little bit of like smokiness to it, but it doesn't actually impart as much of that vanilla baking spices, aroma and flavor on it. Um, so you'll inevitably run across uh, servers who always ask you, do you like oaky buttery or do you like stainless Chardonnay? Um, this is more of like an in the middle situation, but you can get Chardonnays that are even close to that Sauvignon Blanc. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Cool. Um, so the next wine that we're going to go to is one of my favorites in the lineup here today, and it's the La Pluma Rosé. So rosé. Rosé, rosé is, is very, very complicated because at the end of the day, rosé is definitely a style of wine, uh, but it doesn't say a lot about the wine that's in the bottle. Um, it means that it's pink for the most part, but we don't know what grapes are used in it. We don't know if there's oak on there. There's all these different ways to make rosé. Um, can anyone take a guess of how we make rosé? I don't have a guess, but it is my favorite type of wine, which probably says a lot more about me than it does anything else, so. <laughs> no, 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 of course. Okay, so most obvious one, and probably one that many of you were thinking but don't wanna say, which is totally okay. We mix red wine and white wine together and it becomes pink. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that's totally a way that we do it. And actually it's pretty a popular way in champagne, um, if you had rosé champagne, because there we're really looking for crisp acid. And one amazing thing about this is if we add white wine and red wine, we can control the color based on how much of each that we put in. We can control some of the flavors and how much of the flavors that we get on it. We can control things like structure, which is like that tannin, that kind of drying sensation we're gonna start getting as we bump into the reds. Um, but all of these things, of course, are really, really controlled when we just add white wines and red wines together. This wine's made a little bit differently. This is called the maceration method. And so grapes, like people, um, were all the same color on the inside. But um, when it comes to the grapes color, that's what makes wine red or white or rosé and often uh, in many cases. And so with this wine, we actually leave the grapes on their skins for an extended period of time. Um, we have a rosé in another kit that only took two hours to get bright magenta, almost fuchsia pink. Here, we're looking at a little bit longer, um, about 10 hours, so quite, quite long in comparison. Um, it's definitely fuller bodied and it's definitely a little higher alcohol than most rosés, but it is dry. Um, really worth mentioning here we have 43% Cabernet Sauvignon, 35% Petit Syrah, and 22% Zinfandel. So this is quite a unique blend for rosé. Um, most of the Provence and French style rosés that you see are made from Grenache, um, sometimes Mavedra, um, a, a kind of a, a blend of the Southern French um, Mediterranean style grapes. So this is quite unique. Um, there aren't many rosés that are based in Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, granted, that's because Cabernet Sauvignon is quite premium in California. Um, so generally speaking, it gets pressed into red wine. Um, but this is a super cool way to see a rosé. Um, definitely has strawberry and raspberry and lemon, maybe some grapefruit. But what's really noticeable here is we did use neutral oak barrels. So the texture from that oxidation that I mentioned a little bit before is really here. It's really round. Um, this is a food rosé, if there ever was one, right? Most rosés are great on their own. Sit by the pool, go to the beach. This one, great for food. What do we think, Tori? You're our rosé expert since you like rosés. I was going to say, this has actually um, so far been my favorite. I really, but I really like rosés, so I'm not, <laughs> I was like, this has been really good. I really like it, and it's sweet and everything, so it's it's good for me. I don't know if we told you or not, Brooke, um, we did also get some meat samples, not um, from In Good Taste, but we did get some from Parma, and so we have a bunch of 
packaged meats here. This one was a salami. And I was oh, like, so oh. if, you, if you think of any that go good with any of the wines, feel free to, to throw those in too, because I know that people have them. I'm not sure if they've cut them up or not. Clearly, I didn't, but I was here for the wine too, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, super fun. Um, and so particularly salamis and sausages, um, cured meats that have fennel, are going to be really, really amazing here. Um, the other thing about this rosé is I love, love, love it with goat cheese. A um, little bit of arugula, maybe sometimes if you're if you're playing at home. Um, that like peppery and really aromatic style um, goes so well with this because you get again some of those pyrazines, right? Those green notes, the grass, the bell pepper, and they play really well with the arugula. Um, and again, it's so smooth that there is really great uh, richness here that you can get an even enhanced more with goat cheese, which has great acid as well. Yeah, an big awesome. Big fan of goat cheese. Yeah, I was like big fan of goat cheese, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, and yeah, I can, I can go for salamis for days. I just, um, obviously being in Dallas, I grew up in New York and we just got an Italy here. So we go and basically just stock up on cured meats, you know, from prosciutto to salamis uh, and do your sausage. And we'll get into the more spicy stuff in a few, but. Good, good. Yeah, no, I, we do. I think the spicy one we got, we did have a pepperoni. Um, we also have like a dry chorizo and a hot salami as well. So I was like, so there are some spicy meats that we have here too for any of the wines that could go with that. Awesome. Yeah, we have a fun, let's, um, let's pop over to the Pinot Noir next, and then we're actually going to get into like the meat party here. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so Pinot Noir is one of the most complicated grapes to grow. Um, it's an easily sunburned grape. The skin for a red wine is pretty, it's, it's thinner than a lot of other red grapes that we grow. Um, with that said, it is one of the most prized possessions in the world of winemaking. Um, some of the most expensive wine in the world is Pinot Noir. Yep, that's our Mr. B Pinot Noir with our little black lab on it. Um, you know, we, we put the lab on the, this label. It's from an LA artist. He's super amazing. But um, I, I always think it's really funny because Pinot Noir is one of those varietals that you don't get everything up front on the nose. Um, it's one of those that you can leave in the glass and let it evolve and develop because there's so many complexities that come from it, which is why we really love Pinot Noir. With that said, um, it's hard to make Pinot Noir exceptional. Um, going back to Burgundy, where Pinot Noir is from in France, um, Domaine Romani Conti, some of the most expensive Pinot Noir in the world, if not the most expensive wine in the world, can easily go for $20,000 a bottle. I kid you not. It is a big boy um, in terms of wine production, really small uh, productions, and they, they really hand uh, harvest everything. They have horses that are still plowing and working the vineyards. It is an exceptional uh, sense of tradition when you go to Burgundy. Um, and if you have gone to France or are going to France as we finally start to get somewhat back to normal. Um, I highly recommend it. It's like three hours from Paris and totally worth the trip. One of the most beautiful places in the world. Not just because I love wine and Pinot Noir. Um, <laughs> but as you taste this wine, one of the things that you may notice, um, this is all Russian River fruit. Russian River Valley is um, a sub AVA within Sonoma. Um, really, really prized for great Pinot Noir. And we did use some French oak here. So of course you're gonna get that vanilla and all these baking spices. But in addition to that, there's cherry, wild mushrooms, um, rhubarb, maybe some clove, and definitely, definitely rich. Um, this is something that would go really well uh, with the chorizo. There's some earthy component to chorizo that you always get to kind of get through. Um, but the acidity on this Pinot Noir will really break through the fat. Um, and I, I think it's a fun little pairing. The other thing about Pinot Noir that I always find so amazing um, is we always have this balance of fruit and earth. And I say that because the best wines in the world are balanced ones. Um, if there is really high alcohol, hopefully there's a little bit of sugar to kind of lighten that load. Um, if we have tannin, that drying sensation on the cheeks, hopefully we have a bit more acidity 
right? So we can kind of salivate through that drying sensation. If there's fruit, a little bit of earth. If there's toast, a little bit of spice. Um, and so Pinot Noir is one of the great examples of being able to truly find balance uh, within everything. And there's a ton of styles of Pinot Noir. Um, this is a little bit richer in texture and consistency, right? Getting more to that grape juice than that water, if you will. Um, but there are a lot of places in the world that make Pinot Noir um, that's a little bit higher in acid and a little bit brighter, almost like an apple juice versus a grape juice, if that makes sense. Um, definitely, definitely a fun one. Yeah, and Teresa, did you bite into the meat with that and see how that texture plays with, um, because we have a little bit of oak here, super exciting to see how these fatty cured and salty meats play with like the fruit and the earth and the, the richness here. Um, it almost brightens it up a little bit and you get to see that acid highlighted. So super fun wine for sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I was reading the chat box too. Is that where you're at, Brooke? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like we have some, some people that like the trees and some not so much, so it's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Teresa, I'm like the same. I'm not like huge into spicy and it's brutal being in the, you know, Southwest, if you will, like everything yeah. like and chorizo and Everything's spicy. spicier. <laughs> yeah. Everything's spicy and I'm kind of like, I prefer not, but um, yeah, that's, but that's like the beauty of food and wine and particularly with wine, like you can find things you really love and elevate certain foods. Um, and ironically, I think that if you went back to the Chardonnay a little bit um, with one of the spicier cured meats later today, you'll find that it makes a really interesting pairing because of that lactic acid that I mentioned, that malolactic fermentation, that buttery creaminess. It's mm -hmm. almost like milk for hot sauce. Um, it does like chill it out. So that's super, super weird, but interesting pairing that you may not ever have. Wouldn't have thought of at all. No, I like that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm like the rule breaker when it comes to pairings. Um, I think, I, I think I make, uh, I think I make chefs kind of like, you know, eyes but light up sometimes like, what are you talking about? Um, because I, I like the fun pairing. So I noticed in the booklet that you guys sent, there were some, there were, there was an option for um, wild pairings or fun pairings or something with it. And some of those were pretty funny. I was like, wow, you would never think to put, you know, Panda Express with some wine, but you know, maybe that's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I love that. Um, I actually had one of um, the big fast food um, companies and I did a tasting with them and they actually just launched a new line of like chicken sandwiches and stuff. So we did pairings just with like their different sauces and chickens and things like that. And it was super cool because um, one of the things that I said about this wine that I think is so fun is jumping into something like sweet and sour sauce where you're getting the tangy tart and the sweetness. Um, the best way to find food and wine pairings, everyone, um, is to just try it. Sometimes it's really worth just experimenting. Um, so just yeah. Just a sample or two. Yeah, no, I was like, that, that for sure, it, it is definitely the best way to go. But I like that you guys give me the idea of it because I might be a little bit too crazy in my pairings, you know? <laughs> totally. Um, so the next one we're going to jump into is the Syrah. So Syrah is one of the most exciting grapes out there, um, originally from the Rhone area. Yep, the Good Trouble Syrah. Um, this is actually a really exciting wine for me to share with you all today. Um, there's a little JL on the bridge in that illustration, and that's actually after John Lewis. The Good Trouble is um, a, a nod to one of John Lewis's famous quotes. And um, actually the proceeds from this wine go to um, a really amazing fund called the Roots Fund, which works to get um, people of color in particular and women, um, the education and training within the wine industry that um, of course has contributed to kind of this divide within the industry. So it's a super That's cool organization. Cool. Yeah, yeah, how cool is that? I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, so they do scholarships and mentorships um, for women and people of color. So super, super cool organization. Um, and that little JL, uh, it's actually this picture that the illustrations from is amazing. It's like a classic picture of um, both Bushes, uh, Clinton, 
the whole squad with John Lewis um, in front of this bridge in um, Alabama. So super, super fun. Um, but yeah, Sarah, Tom, you're, you're speaking my language here. Syrah is like the most interesting aromatic grape out there. Um, there is one place called Cote Roti in the Rhone where we co-ferment, which means we take red wine and white wine, uh, red grapes and white grapes rather, and we, we put them together in the vat while they ferment. Um, and that's called Cote Roti. And Viognier, which we mix the Syrah with, is also like a very beautiful perfumey, um, perfumey wine. But this one, as I mentioned that Viognier, the reason why we do that is Viognier has honeysuckles and lilacs and all these beautiful flowers. But Syrah, exactly everyone, we're getting to it. Syrah is very meaty and spicy and peppery and big. Um, actually, if you can look behind me, most of this is Penfolds, which is Shiraz from Australia. Um, I worked for Penfolds for quite some time. Um, so I love Syrah. I'm so glad to see the reception here. This is making me so excited because I think Syrah people here for sure. <laughs> yeah, we get plum and black pepper and lilac and lavender and uh, maybe some jasmine, just really beautiful mix of everything. Also being a Texan, we eat a lot of brisket nothing goes better with brisket than this Syrah. Um, you know, just like that bacony, meaty smokiness to it. Um, it makes a perfect pairing for barbecue, no matter what kind of barbecue really. Um, this is like the one that goes with sausage. It spent 22 months in French oak here, 30% of it was new. So again, a lot of that vanilla, bacon spices. Um, we call Syrah the grape of the gods. And as I mentioned before, Shiraz is one example um, from Barossa, but also some from South Africa. It is Syrah, same grape. And Hermitage as well, which is from Rhone. It also has the same peppercorn um, here, compound that you see in peppercorns, um, in black pepper and green peppers. And so, yes, this is the brisket. This is the brisket king. I enjoy that everyone's enjoying it. I, I love to hear it. Syrah is um, super special. Just a quick like little anecdote. Um, I went to school in the Finger Lakes region of New York and um, I was working with the master sommelier there while I was still in college. And he gives me a solo cup of really big, think about, look at, how, look at the color of this wine, right? It's so rich, it's so deep and dark in color. So I'm sitting in a vat of like Cabernet Franc he hands me this plastic, you know, solo cup and he says, okay, walk us through the tasting here because blind tasting is a huge thing when you're preparing to be a sommelier. And so um, this was a, so this was actually a French um, Cote de Rhone. So Syrah blend, but mostly Syrah here. It was a weird one. And um, again, the jasmine, the, we call it purple flowers, right? Whatever flowers that really is. The bacon spice, the black pepper, and this dark rich color brought me to Syrah. Um, and so I, I love that story because um, all these things that you're saying that you really enjoy, this is one of the best wines to blind taste because it is so, so specific. You're gonna um, know right when you taste it that that's, that's what you're getting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it can be quite polarizing. It's a little big for some people. It is, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it is. It's, there's a lot of flavor there, for sure. <laughs> yeah. We got um, flavorful people on this call, though, so good news. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even if you guys swirled this glass, look at the staining on the glass and, and you know, the, the, the drops, the legs, if you will, that are coming down from here. Um, really rich, really big, but really delicious with so many foods. Um, I really, really love this wine with everything that's piggy, a good pork chop, lamb. Um, it's, this is, to me, sometimes a better steak wine than Cabernet. So I, I love that we've gotten great reception here. Um, yeah, that is very good. Awesome. Very full. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to do a bit of a, let's call it a judgment of Paris here. So I'll tell you all the stories. As you pour the two Cabernets, um, we're going to skip over the red blend, but we'll get back to that. So um, there's a blue game theory and a green game theory. Wine one is going to be that blue game theory bottle of Cabernet. 
and wine too is going to be that green um, bottle of Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you've seen the movie Bottle Shock, you'll already know what I'm going to tell you, but hang in there with me. Um, the Judgment of Paris happened in 1976. There was a lovely British gentleman who unfortunately passed away this year um, of old age, uh, Stephen Spurrier, fantastic, fantastic man who was a wine merchant and was based in France. And he chose to have a competition. Um, remember, this is 1976, so Napa Valley is not what it is today. We do have some amazing wines being produced, um, but it definitely isn't respected on a global scale. And so he was really taken with the quality of California wines, and he arranged to have a blind tasting of two regions, mostly Bordeaux, first growth Bordeaux, and Napa Valley. And so Stephen Spurrier hopped over the pond, came to Napa Valley, and recruited all of these wineries to participate in Paris. Um, it was a 1973 vintage, and obviously the French were very excited to participate because they just assumed they'd win. Um, and it was all blind tasting, mostly French judges, which I always love to mention. And like long story short, spoiler alert, the United States won. Um, both white and red wines. And when we did it again 10 years later with the Culinary Institute of America, they won again. Um, Stephen Spurrier had a 30 year anniversary um, of the 1976 tasting where he got most of the original gang together, uh, who is still around. And America won again, actually. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Um, and while that isn't to say that French wine isn't fantastic and sometimes better or um, you know, incredible quality. It did allow American wines to be put on the map and be respected forever. Um, and, and so we really, really have that tasting to thank for, um, for ultimately uh, the, the quality and respect that America and wines get from around the world. Um, of that entire 11 judges, only one was American, one was British, and the rest were French. So um, I do think it says a ton. Um, Stag's Leap Wine Cellars won for the red wines um, and Chateau Montalena won for the white wines. So super exciting. But right now we're gonna have a bit of our own judgment of Paris. Um, so buckle up and I'll walk you through. So the first wine um, is from Paso Robles. And I think it's the really important to mention that Paso is kind of like, all of the classic Napa Valley wineries, you know, uh, rebellious children. It is a place where we break the rules, we push boundaries, and definitely make wine that's different um, from the norm. So this first wine, as you taste it, um, this is the Blue Game Theory Cabernet Sauvignon. I'll just keep reiterating so everyone knows where we are. Um, is 100% stainless steel tanks, which is pretty rare for Cabernet, no matter where you are in the world, although not unheard of. And you get amazing aromatics of cherry and licorice. It's jammy, really ripe fruit, blackberry, blueberries, plum. Um, and doing stainless steel fermentation here allows you to see the grape for itself. There's no oak complexities here. So this is truly Cabernet Sauvignon, what you taste. Um, I think it's really interesting also to note that we don't get so much of that green bell pepper and stuff here, but we get a lot of like that brambly, juicy, tricolor berries, right? Blackberries, raspberries, blueberries. Um, and also almost like a, not quite a menthol quality, but yeah, like a nice, almost like that true black licorice kind of a thing here. So for the second one, we're gonna go up north to the Alexander Valley, um, really premium AVA for Cabernets. Um, have been producing a ton of exceptional wine for a long time. This is kind of our French style. 22 months in French oak barrel, low ABV, like 13% maybe. Um, and because the Alexander Valley is pretty warm, we have a lot of ripening here and a lot of developed flavors. Uh, moderate climate, moderate temperature rather in 2018. Um, so the flavors really got to develop as the grapes were ripening early on, which is super exciting. Um, 
you get black currant, plum, maybe herbs, kind of like a, a herbs de Provence, you know, rosemary, thyme, some barnyard, right? There's some earthy qualities here, savory, herbal notes, almost eucalyptus, menthol kind of a thing. It is definitely tart, almost cranberry, white pepper, cedar, violet, and definitely significant tannins, right? So you're really feeling on your cheeks that kind of plucky uh, texture. Totally different wine. Both are from Cabernet. Exactly, Rodney. Perfect example, right? Jordan um, has one of their vineyards and sites and, and cuvées that they pull from Alexander Valley. Yeah, these wines couldn't be any more different despite being the same vintage. And I mean, realistically, they're probably like 100 plus, you know, like about 100 miles away from each other, maybe less. Um, so pretty, pretty crazy how different the wines are. And this is just really the addition of oak um, and the microclimate around it. Do we have any favorites of the two? Please feel free to say uh, which one you enjoyed more in the first. Actually, I like the one from Passau better. Yeah, so it's super funny. The first one is definitely very American in style, rich, round, um, very fruit forward. And then the second one is kind of like big and bold and, you know, complicated. It's a big wine that I think can age for a little bit and be totally, totally um, benefited from aging for a bit. And then um, the structure on the second one, it's so interesting, right? That oak, how you don't get the tannin, the same kind of tannin on that first one that you get from the second. And so tannin, that cheek structure thing that I keep mentioning, tannin happens from two places. The first is the grape skin and the second is the barrel. Um, so with that second one, yeah, you really get that hardiness from that, that oak aging. 22 months in French oak is a long time. I mean, even by French standards. I think I like the Alexander Valley one better too, the green label. It's it's fruitier, I guess, to me or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a super fun question. And so actually with that, Jeff, you're you're gonna pop over and we're gonna finish up, but feel free to keep your favorite one of the two in the glass and let it hang out and develop um, as we finish with the balance of powers, that red blend. So this is the last one. Um, and so, okay, to be entirely frank with you guys, because we have nothing to lose here, red blends are super complicated because they virtually mean nothing. You can have, like rosé, a million different varietals, and we have no clue what's in the glass. And that can be really challenging. Um, but the lower cost red blends, what we're seeing is Central Valley, um, which is in Central California, not actually too far um, to like San Joaquin Valley, uh, Bakersfield, truly the agricultural center of California. We traditionally don't do a lot of agriculture in wine producing regions because with wine vines, we like them to struggle. We don't want them to be on fertile land. Um, Central Valley is madhouse, right? Bulk produced California wines. Um, and so many of those grapes are, um, Zinfandels, Petit Syrahs, uh, Mavedra, Matar, like or Mataro, depending where you are, um, same grape, Grenache, some Syrah, um, Tempranillos, uh, big zesty red wines, varietals that are hybrids that don't even have names that you would know um, that are coming out of UC Davis now. And they are meant to fit an American palate. They're not necessarily ageable. Um, they're usually spicy and zesty and have a little bit of sugar, which is a good thing because they ripen so much. Um, I think this is the whole deal. Are you ready to quit your jobs and become winemakers? Here it goes. We ripen grapevines to have sugar and then the sugar gets eaten by yeast and the byproduct of that is alcohol, right? And so heat as well, but that does nothing for us here, but alcohol. So when we let all the yeast eat all of the sugar, we get a very high alcohol wine, which we saw out of California for a long time. And Jeff, I'm assuming that these are probably some that you didn't enjoy as much. They're high alcohol. We're talking like 18, 19, 20% alcohol um, because we let the yeast eat all the sugar. And so there's no residual sugar, right? Leftover sugar. 
but also it's really high in alcohol now, and now it's not balanced. But if we leave a little bit of sugar and let the alcohol maybe get to like 16, 17% maximum, you know, keep it lower than 18% where it starts getting hot, we can find balance in those blends. I think that wine blends um, are so exciting because it allows us to make up for any faults or, or lacking that we get from other grapes, right? Penfolds, the one behind me, really famous for blending in Australia. And it's because if one wine has more acid and less alcohol, and the other wine has maybe more alcohol, less acid, one has a lot more tannin than the other one, one has more fruit, one has more earth. When we mix them together, we get this really balanced wine. So blending, when it's done well, is fantastic, second to none. Think about first growth Bordeaux, right? They're usually not just one grape, they're blend. Meritage blend, that means Bordeaux grapes blended together, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and a couple of others, but we'll keep it simple today. Um, when you blend well, it's magic. But when you just kind of make bulk wine and we put cheaper grapes together with more expensive ones to feel like we have the Cabernet, that's where we start getting like, you know, these unbalanced, really hot wines that aren't enjoyable at all. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with red blends. They mean so many different things and there are some fantastic ones out there, um, but we do get value out of that because we're not drinking 100% Napa Cabernet, which is on land that is some of the most expensive land in the world. Um, and we can go to these other regions that are producing grapes and blend them together. So it's a good, it's a good mix and we're, we're still getting better. Um, as wine quality continues to improve at more reasonable prices, we'll start seeing more of those in single varietals too. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, they, they've always been kind of a mystery, so appreciate it. <laughs> They're still a mystery. <laughs> no, I agree. I was like, I, I think red blends have always been kind of a mystery to me too. So thank you for that. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And Jim, you mentioned that Alexander Valley length, that mouthfeel, that um, the, the amount of time that it lasts on your palate. Part of that is what I look for in ageability. And part of that is because of the barrel aging and just the fruit is like super stellar in the Alexander Valley. Um, it's very French in the sense that they don't really irrigate there. It is very, very, very rustic grapes. And then they have such complexity and flavor. We also had a great year this year. So you're tasting an exceptional, exceptional example of Alexander Valley for sure. Um, but that lingering sensation is really enjoyable um, and adds to complexity. And of course the overall ageability, we want this to kind of grow and evolve in time. And so, um, that's definitely something that we look for. We call it the finish. Um, and in Wine and Spirits Education Trust, which is one of the governing and awarding bodies for wine education, as well as sake and beer and spirits, but for wine education, we always talk about the finish because that's a really important indicator of overall quality. You want that wine to last, not just stop short. So this red blend, um, I, I do want to say before anything, we could have called this red blend Zinfandel because it has 85% Zinfandel and 15% Syrah. Anything over 70% of the grape can be called that grape if it's a California wine. Super complicated and can be really misleading, um, but we call it a blend so you understand that it's a blend. Um, and so when you taste this wine, you'll notice the alcohol is pretty big, right? 15%, um, but it is rounded, a little bit of that richness. And going back to the Syrah, because I know Syrah is a popular one with many of you, um, you may kind of get that peppery spice, but it's interesting because that kind of cranberry has turned into like toffee and some of the vanilla is still there. Um, we did do 20% of this for 22 months in New French Oak. And there is a tiny bit of sugar left on it as well. Um, but that's mostly from the Zinfandel, which is the flagship California varietal. Um, Zinfandel has all the fun stuff. It's spicy, it's juicy, it's rich. I really enjoy Zinfandel. Um, and I really enjoy the spiciness that you get from it. It's almost like a, you know, like holiday spice, like truly spice cake. 
um, but also has spiciness on it. And so I, I find it very enjoyable. Truly California's flagship and also um, it's identical to a Croatian grape called Tribadrog and Italian Primitivo. So if you see Primitivos, um, especially David, if you like Zin, um, Primitivo is Zinfandel from Italy. Ah, full body, yeah. So when we say full body, what we're talking about is kind of the richness of it. Um, it is basically the difference between, again, like that water to grape juice or soda kind of combination. I don't like to use soda because there's bubbles in it. That's kind of complicated. But imagine like the difference between water and if you have had um, any like fruit juice, right? Grape juice is a really good example. Um, the richness is that roundness. So part of the, part of, part, a few things go into um, full body. First is alcohol, higher alcohol, usually fuller body. More tannin, gonna lean to the fuller body. Riper fruit, so we spoke about fruit ripeness today. Um, the more ripe usually contributes to a fuller body. More extraction in the color, usually a fuller body, right? The Pinot Noir is light. Um, the, the Pinot Noir is a lighter style of red wine today. And the Syrahs or one of the cabs are gonna be richer in style, fuller in body. Um, Yes, Merlot to Cab. So when you think about Merlot and the flavors that come from Merlot, I always say uh, after the movie Sideways, Merlot gets a bad rep, but it really is like one of the most pleasant uh, grapes. And Bordeaux blends Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon because they are great partners and they do contribute to wines in different ways. Um, so with Merlot, it's a little lower in acid. Um, so think about that salivating quality. Cabernet Sauvignon, higher in acid. Remember, its parent is Sauvignon Blanc, crisp, crisp, crisp. So that's the first thing that we like between the two. Um, Merlot has a lot more of the cacao, coffee bean, espresso kind of aromas to it. Um, and maybe more purple fruit, blacker fruit, darker fruits. Whereas Cabernet Sauvignon is gonna have more spice. It's gonna have more jalapeno, green bell pepper, and more red fruit. Um, more kind of cranberry, cherry, tart, tart fruit because of that acid. So the two go really well together because Cabernet Sauvignon, if you don't oak it, as you can tell by the blue um, game theory today, you actually can't really say that that's a full body, um, right? Compared to the second one, that oak made that body really different. It feels so much richer. Um, think about like, um, think about the richness between like a cream sauce and like a, you know, a tomato based sauce or a broth, just totally, totally different from one another in that like structure. Um, and so Merlot is actually really rich and really hearty, uh, even without oak. So those two balance each other really well. Um, so they are quite different from one another, but they do really work well together. I hope that answers your question, Tom. I can talk about Merlot for years. Um, so. Ah, decanting. The wines that you want decanted are what needs to be decanted. Um, the most important thing is that you enjoy the wines, but I would say um, the Alexander Valley Cab is a great example of a wine that probably could use a little decanting. Syrah also does really well when it's decanted um, because it has so many complexities. Um, when, when wine is very complex and you feel like it's stuck um, one of the things that you want to do is open it up. Oxygen really helps kind of expedite aging, but open up all those flavanols and aromatics so you can smell them and thus taste them better. Um, so definitely those bigger wines. Um, also, if a wine has had a lot of oak treatment, they really generally benefit from decanting them because they basically went from oak where they were having lots of oxygen and then they got literally squeezed into a bottle, an inert bottle that has virtually no oxygen, very little bit coming in through the cork. Um, so to reintroduce it to oxygen really opens up the wine very well. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, higher alcohol, higher tannin. Yeah, tannins can be really, really structured so they do deal well. Um, but even with a medium tannin wine like Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay even, 
um, benefit from decanting because they're so complex and they have so many aromatics, you want it to kind of open up. Um, so sometimes with more tannins, you do, um, but you don't ever want to decant too much because then we start to allow the wine to decay um, and ultimately kind of lose some of that body. We want to keep those tannins. The last thing that I will say about decanting wine, um, in addition to kind of tannins, the alcohol and the structure and the oak treatment, to be fair, more tannins um, are generally for more oak treatment too. So those work well. The last piece is if it has a little bit of like a off aroma, maybe sulfur, that's sometimes SO2, and you want that to kind of blow off when you open the bottle. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I know we're, we're a little bit over today. Um, no, that's everything. totally fine. I think I was gonna say it went, it worked well because we had a lot of questions. I was like, that always is great. So, um, if you any more question there, it looks like. Oh, is there? Uh, it seems to me that the more um, tannins a wine has, the more you want to let it breathe. Did you re-answer that one? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. 19 crimes. That's so funny, Jeff. And so um, I worked, Penfolds and Treasury Wine Estates actually owns 19 crimes. So um, I got to work on mostly the fine wine in the portfolio, but it was a super fun brand to work with. Pre-Snoop as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Jim. And um, so I'm going to also um, just in the chat put in my discount code for everyone who attended today. There's $3 off. If anyone is interested in a six pack, we sell individual varietals. So one bottle from today, you can get it in a six pack if you really enjoy it. Um, it's totally available for you. That's great. No, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. I'll send that out to some of the people that maybe had to drop off early too, just so that they can have that. Cause that's awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, Tori does have my info. And if you guys have any wine questions for me um, about this tasting, but otherwise I like to say that I come with a lifetime warranty, please just reach out to me. I love getting emails from consumers and um, I'm happy to help in any way. I have many wine lists if you're looking for something specific um, or just kind of talking through a dinner party. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brooke. This was awesome. So I hope everyone enjoyed or enjoyed, I'm sorry, the presentation. I'm like, after eight samples here, this is going to be a little bit of a mess. So everyone, um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. And um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, yeah, if you guys need anything, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, Brooke as well, and Dave Binkunski as well. So we've got lots of people to reach out to if you guys need anything else. So thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Cheers.